Um, okay, uh, thank you. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, thank you all for making it out of bed after yesterday's uh, festivities. Um, I'm going to uh, hopefully not strain you too much, but I'm, trying, I'm going to try and give three talks in, in the next uh, hour or so. So uh, let's see how that goes. Uh, and if, in particular, I'm going to talk about electron acceleration. I'm going to talk about radiation generation, as some, quite a lot of overlap with what Dino's talked about, and a little bit about ion acceleration as well. Um, uh, I, I've also put some things, as well as the usual uh, PR kind of things, I've put some things which we haven't quite explained. There's a lot of unpublished work in this talk, just because I thought people have been asking, what kind of problems can we work on? Uh, sometimes when you give talks, it seems like we know everything, and I can tell you that we have so much data where we don't really know what's going on at all. So I'll show you examples of that. Anyway, quick introduction. Dino gave an, uh, Dino's talk was pretty much the, uh, a great introduction anyway, but just to, from maybe the students, the simplest way of looking. So I'm going to talk about electron acceleration in the, the bubble regime, which was briefly mentioned. The simplest way of looking at the bubble regime is a, is a case where you have an intense laser pulse, almost spherical kind of laser pulse, for reasons I'll tell, I might tell you later. Um, this laser pulse is going to be so intense that as it comes into a plasma, its, it's, it's um, contramotive force, its radiation pressure is enough to completely expel plasma electrons and leave a cavity. It leaves an ion cavity, it's again, similar to what Dina was talking about. And so you'll see it, um, we're moving in the speed of light frame with this bubble. So here's the plasma coming now and it's gonna push electrons, make a sheath around it, as you see like that. Um, obviously, their ions are much heavier, they're left behind, and so there's an electric field from the ions up to this electron sheath in this direction, which means um, that there is a force inwards if you were an electron, um, if you were an electron, say up here, which is about to see this big, big thing hitting you, uh, you'll see a, a force that's gonna pull you inwards and eventually pull you forwards as well. So actually, let's, let's put an electron there. Let's put an electron somewhere right at the top here of that bubble and see what happens to it. Imagine it's just been hit by this structure traveling at, at, at the speed of light. And uh, as it slips backwards, it's gaining energy in the forward direction. If this bubble is big enough or intense enough, it can gain enough velocity in the time that the bubble passes that it can stay in phase with, uh, with the bubble. It can travel at its phase velocity, the phase velocity of the laser pulse in the plasma. And it starts to, as we've heard in a number of talks, I think Amita, he talked about it as well, that you start to surf along, oh no, it was, it was, sorry, it was Bob who likes talking about surfing. Um, you surf along with this uh, coherent structure and you gain an energy which is dependent on the velocity of the structure, it's gamma phase, right? Um, gamma phase squared, that's the usual Doppler um, gamma squared term. And the energy of, the, of, the poten of the, this potential well which is something like twice the rest mass energy multiplied by some factor which is just bigger or smaller depending on how big you grew the plasma wave. And so it depends on the intensity normally as well. Okay, so to study that kind of experiment, we use the Astro Gemini laser. I've said before, it's the laser which Rajiv is responsible for. So everything that goes wrong, we go to him first and, and, and shout at him. Sorry, Rajiv. Um, uh, we typically, we get five week runs on this experiment. Unlike Dina, we don't have full time access to this facility. So but when we're there, we try and characterize as many things as we possibly can. So we set up this experiment, tear it down all in four or five weeks or something like that. And so for example, this is what the interaction chamber looks like. There would be a target, which is, a again, you heard a gas jet or more increasingly we use a gas cell. Uh, again, a gas cell is just uh, a box filled with gas, but now we, we typically have a, a stage that we can easily change, uh, finely change the, the, the length of the cell, as you'll see later. Uh, we do some optical probing. You'll see some of that later. This is an interferogram showing that actually the interaction, even though our Rayleigh length is of the order of millimeters, uh, because of the relativistic self-focusing, which you all know about, we, we can typically get easily centimeter interaction. So this is a centimeter gas jet in this case, um, without trying too hard. This is the transmitted laser spot, and you can actually see that even after a centimeter, there's a still a guided filament of high intensity. And then the, the, main, the main issue is we have uh, some magnets that deflect electrons sideways, depending on their energy, depending on their momentum. And so from that, we can tell their energy. We also typically put in a radiation uh, detector, because there'll be radiation produced, as Dino just said as well. And we'll talk about that in a second as well. So this is our typical results up until a couple of years ago with an experiment that was designed to go straight into the bubble regime. And so straight into the bubble regime means that the bubble was big enough directly when we focused the laser intensity at an A naught of about three or four, such that this, 
I mean, I simplified that. Obviously, Dino gave a more better example of how injection happens. But this simplified method of injection, where, you, where this transverse motion leads to injection. Um, and so for, for that kind of intensity, you would, you would expect immediately electrons to be produced. Uh, I haven't put this. This is a function of density here. These are spectra which are on a magnetic spectrometer. So energy is greater up. This is a less deflected beam. Uh, and you can see um, that over a range of densities, I haven't put the numbers here, but these are in the, in the mid-10 to the 18s. You get these relatively nice, relatively stable looking beams. Well, they look nice to me. They don't always look nice to accelerator physicists. They look nice in the sense that they have a reasonable amount of energy at high charge, something in the order of 100 picocoulombs. There's, there's a congregation of the, the energy at, at that charge because actually as, as more and more electrons fall down that potential well, when they congregate into the bottom, when they start to dephase, um, they, ooh, did I do? Um, you, you start to get, um, you start to get a congregation of electrons with, the, with this particular energy, which is at this def defaced energy. Uh, and then if you go to higher densities, actually you see the beams tend to get worse because again, as, as Dino was talking about, as the lasers start to hit the laser pulse, which is sitting on the front of the pulse, they start to get wiggled and thrown about. Um, and, and their maximum energy goes down as well. And actually, there's this one over n scaling which many, many people have talked about. Actually, the maximum energy that they can be accelerated to pretty much follows the one over n scaling. Uh, the problem you can see, though, of course, is we should, for a one over n scaling, we should just keep on going lower and lower density. And you think you'd get higher and higher energy. But actually, injection stops pretty abruptly, irrespective almost of the interaction length that we take. So for these parameters, uh, Typically, we get to about a GeV maximum energy gain, and, and that was about it. OK, so naively, we thought, OK, um, so uh, we want to get higher energies. Um, higher energy depends on um, uh, an equation which looks something like 1 over the density dependence, um, and it depends on A0 as well. So if I want to go to lower density, let's ignore the A0 bit for a second. If I want to go to lower density, um, perhaps I'm not being able to accelerate at low density because I haven't been guiding very well. So if I want to guide better at, at, at lower density, uh, what I should do is um, my spot size, there's a condition for what the spot size of the laser should be for good guiding, um, actually should increase with density. It goes uh, proportional 1 over kp, goes proportional to um, uh, omega p, so, uh, 1 over omega p, sorry, so that at, at lower density, um, I, I, I would get a bigger spot size. Um, and uh, that means that my match spot size is actually proportional to the fourth power to the inverse dens uh, density. Uh, if I put that into this equation, and remember that my A naught also depends, if I make my spot size, this is the downside obviously, if I make my spot size bigger, I'm saying I can, I can match at lower density so I could go to higher, higher energies. Or of course, if I make my spot size bigger, then my intensity is lower as well. And so, uh, this omega, to this W spot size to the four just about covers a W spot size squared, inverse W spot size squared, to give me a, to give me a potentially a, a larger energy gain. Of course, I say all of this, but I have reduced the intensity to do all of this. And since intensity is going to be really important for injecting particles, you think this is probably a stupid thing to do. We tried it anyway. You know, we're, we're all for doing stupid things. Uh, we did it by, um, actually, we didn't have any more space to do this experiment. So we did it by actually folding in a longer um, focusing optic. And um, to do that, um, I think I remember Tanaka-san saying uh, on Monday morning that um, that, one back? Um, that you, you needed to find um, uh, mirrors which could take uh, mid-10 to the 12 intensities on target or something like that. And indeed, that's what we needed to do as well, to be able to find a mirror that could, to, that could live here. Um, uh, actually, was obviously not a trivial thing, even though the manufacturer, CVI, said that they could deliver such things. It took us a good few weeks before we found a magical mirror that couldn't withstand the intensity. So um, this, with this magical mirror, which we called Bernie, because all the other mirrors before it burnt, um, we were able to now use this longer focal length um, uh, interaction, and, and everything has to be folded, basically. It's the same, same experiment, same kind of experiment. It's just been flipped in from one direction to the other. Um, but, uh, and there you see there's a gas cell here that we're uh, doing this in. 
Okay, so uh, one nice thing, so we went to lower density, um, and now actually we could, we could find a regime again, which is kind of pleasing, is where we said we could make these nice monogenetic beams. Actually, we could kind of make nice monogenetic beams with this longer focal length interaction again. Um, and this was at a lower density than we'd injected in previous experiments. Uh, the only disappointing thing is the energy gain is not, not particularly much higher, and I'll tell you the reason for that in a second. Uh, but anyway, there's, there's reasonably nice beams um, of the order of maybe even 10 picocoulombs and um, um, an energy spread of the few percent range. So the, the kind of typical monogenetic beams that we produce. However, an even more interesting thing happened when we started going back up in density. And so when we went up back up in density, rather than getting the same kind of energies that we used to before, we, we were actually kind of almost doubling the energy we got on target. We go well above 2 GV energy gain. Again, we get these long streaking um, spectra. There are, this energy scale is bad, so sometimes there are peaks quite near the top. But, um, but anyway, the fact that we could get more than a couple of GV energy gain uh, was quite pleasing. Um, actually, so this, I said I talked about the gas cell that we could vary in length. So uh, here's, here's, a, here's a run where we've actually varied the gas cell length. And you can see that, that there, is a, there is some, as we increase the length, you can see that the maximum energy increases and then it decreases again. Again, if you think of that bubble structure, remember that the accelerating field was only for half of the bubble structure, right? Once you get past the middle, it would decelerate it as well. And in fact, the fields in a, in a bubble are pretty much uh, linear with position such that you, get a, you, you would get a parabolic dependence on the energy gain. And that's kind of what you see, actually. You kind of see, a, you know, you can fit a parabola to that. And if you fit a parabola to this energy gain, um, actually you find for some of our interactions, we're getting energy gains. I mean, this happening in, you know, happening in less than a centimeter uh, for a couple of GV gains. So we're getting more than 500 gigavolts per meter. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous electric fields for people who, remember, who know numbers. Um, there's, there's some other interesting features in this as we go to longer length as well. Actually, you can see that there's, there almost seems like there's two, two, gen, two bunches of electron beams generated. So there's this first one, which gets accelerated and maybe decelerated again. But you can see these slightly more colored, I'm sorry, the color bars, color scale, it's not particularly great on this projector, but you can see there's almost a second bunch of electrons which are accelerated and stay to a lower energy, but in larger number for longer lengths. And so for longer lengths, we're actually, it seems like there's another injection mechanism happening. There's, there's some other electrons being introduced. Okay, so, um, so the question obviously would be, what, why, does the, why are we doing better with the F40 to the F20? And, and actually, if you go to the same kind of densities where we're kind of optimal for the F20, which kind of, again, optimal for the F40 is about 3 to the 18, and you do a 3D simulation, and you'd look at it in first light, and actually it doesn't look that much different. Um, uh, the, the only thing you might notice, so actually in both cases, we're, we're in a situation where um, actually in, in, uh, the, the laser intensity trapped within that bubble is, is not only confined spatially, but it's also hitting against the front of this kind of density shock. And so it's compressing in time. And because of that compression, you can see that the A0 is actually going well above what we expected. So even though we started with a lower A0 in the F40 case, by some time into the gas jet, it's caught up with the F20, and they're, they're almost following the same path of intensity. And the intensity is being amplified all the time. The intensity actually goes to A0 in the simulations greater than 10. Uh, simulations don't 100% agree with this, the experiments. But anyway, let's assume that phenomenologically, they're about the same thing. In fact, probably the only difference you can see is obviously with the harder focusing with the F20, uh, obviously it got to a higher A0 initially, so there's, there's this, initial phase, which is a little bit different from the F20. Now, this graph on the bottom is a little bit more complicated. This is the electric field. Uh, again, because of the A0, the electric field that you generate of the bubble is about the same in, in both simulation. But this is actually the electric field that accelerated electrons, the most, the most energetic electrons field in, in the simulation. And, and what you can see here is that actually in the case of the F20, the, the, the electrons are they're injected much more quickly there are electrons which are injected when the A0 is not particularly high, when that intensity amplification hasn't happened that much. Um, and they, they then go on to see not particularly high electric fields in the subsequent interaction, mainly because there's a lot of charge in there, which is negating the, the fields of the wake field as a process called beam loading. However, for the F40 case, you can see the injection happens much later. It happens actually only after that first intensity amplification happens. 
Uh, and then they, they see much higher electric field strengths. They see these, you know, the kind of electric field strengths we were, we were measuring, much larger field strengths. And because of that, they get a much larger acceleration. And uh, you can see that this is a time history of um, energy momentum as a function of distance. So if you take one of these line lines through here, you would get the spectrum at any given time. And you, you can kind of see this, the same behavior, right? You can see that the, in the F40 case, they get to much higher energies than they get to in the, in the F20 case. Um, you can also see, uh, though this was at high density, you can also see there's always, uh, with the F40 case as well, you'll see that there's a, a very initial um, injection of electrons which can lead to very monotonic. So if I just stopped here, you'd get a very monotonic spectrum as well. And that actually uh, corresponds to this first very, very fast increase in intensity. And so this, the, the, this increase in intensity is actually turns out to be very, very important, as I think I'll show in this simulation frame. Um, you'll see that um, as well as the, the mechanisms Dino talked about, what we're finding is that as the, as the bubbles, as the intensity increases, the bubble size increases, and as the bubble size increases, actually that behaves like, if you imagine the back of the pulse, is actually now not traveling as fast as the front of the pulse. So for a while, it reduces the effective velocity that the electrons have to gain before they get turned around and injected. And so that actually helps our injection quite a bit. And so uh, here's a comparison of F40 and F20 simulations. You can see the biggest spot size in the F40 case. Here, this is injected already. Here, there's only a very, that would be a monogenic beam for a while, injection. But then as the intensity increases, then both interactions look very, very similar, except the F20 has got a lot more charge in it. And because of the charge, you can see that the, the bubble shape is being deformed. And actually, at the end, you can see because of that charge, it, it actually goes a little bit unstable. Um, these are two particular planes of the 3D interaction. Uh, and you can see it's actually fallen off to the bottom of one side, which is why you don't see it in the middle plane anymore from, from that simulation. Um, OK. So, th so this is, again, simulation frames from a, a simulation done for a slightly lower parameter. It's not Gemini parameters. It's for a laser in Germany, which is nearer one joule. And again, you see the same kind of things as a plasma wave. It traps energy as it self-focuses. As that energy compresses, the bubble size gets bigger. And because of that lengthening of bubble size, you get, uh, you get injection happening. So we know all this dynamics from, uh, from uh, simulations. Actually, it turns out we can measure this as well. So one of the nice things about that Yeno laser is that they have a, a, an ultra-short uh, transverse probe. They have a three femtosecond probe, and they've done shadowgraphy with this. And you can actually see almost all the, all the features that you, you see in simulations reproduced in, um, in, in the experiment. In particular, you see these density modulations that you see by deflection, by shadowgraphy. Um, and you, you even see this formation of almost a, a single bubble, uh, a single spike, a single cycle plasma wave, which is, which is the typical thing for the bubble regime. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show some more um, um, uh, probing data, uh, this time from Gemini laser. Um, on Gemini, as yet, Rajiv, why not? We don't have a three femtosecond or five femtosecond probe beam, very bad. Um, but so, so we probe with the same uh, pulse duration, which is 30 femtos. So I'm just joking to him. I'm not really uh, upset with his laser pulse. We wrote that much. Um, uh, we have a 30 femtosecond pulse. So actually, you don't see the wake. You don't see the wake motion inside of it because now, over 30 femtoseconds, that oscillation is, is 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 averaged over a cycle, and so you don't see the plasma wave anymore. But you see the general behavior of how the laser pulse passes through the plasma, what, what the plasma it leaves behind looks like. And this is what it looks like. Oops, sorry. Ah, go back. Uh, it looks like, um, well, uh, Raoul talked about it. You can see, uh, actually, you can see lots of filamentation happening in this laser pulse. So there's a cone, which is very similar to the input uh, cone. And you can see filamented structures within it. Um, actually, it turns out, as I said, that there is a high-intensity filament in this, which you don't see. And um, so if you image the laser spot going to the, to, to the exit, there is a high intensity part which is driving a wake field. So it's, it's not as bad as it looks like on first uh, case. You see this very bright feature right at the beginning. Um, and actually, it's, it corresponds to these, these very sharp filaments with a very prescribed angle. Um, uh, if, you, if you spectrally disperse this radiation, this turns out to be Raman scattering. So Raman scattering is quite important, even in these very, very short pulse interactions. And in fact, actually, this angle, you can see it vary with density. It depends on one over omega p. So it's, it's kind of the, the optimal angle for which 
Um, three wave mixing, probably, again, for those of you who know about Raman scattering, you'll know that you can't Raman scatter directly in the forward direction, three wave scatter in the forward direction. And so there's an optimal angle that you must go off to begin side scattering. And that's, that's the angle that you see here. And, and for this interaction, actually, you see the whole thing. This was a gas jet, and so this is the whole plasma that we generated because we, the probe beam was set such that it passed af after, the, after the laser pulse. Here's where the laser pulse was the driving the, the interaction at the time we took this image. Um, if, we, if we move the timing relative to the interaction, you can see the plasma gets shorter, right? So we moved um, where the laser pulse is. Uh, and unfortunately, I drew, we drew a line over actually something interesting. So that almost the same features, just the laser pulse hasn't passed all the way through the gas jet. But you might start to see there's a little brightness. That's not the dotted line. There's a little bright thing happening there. Actually, we, we move even earlier in time, and you can see that bright thing is really bright now. Um, if that's where the drive pulse should be, and that's really uh, amplified um, by the probe beam, amplified the probe beam. And then when we overlay it on the region where the round scattering is very high, then it just blows up completely. We were a bit worried we'd blown up one of Rajiv's cameras, but it, it was all right, don't worry. It was fine. Um, here's a simulation of that happening. So this simulation is actually going to have a probe beam coming from the bottom upwards. You won't see the probe beam for most of the interaction because its intensity is so low compared to this is the main driving laser pulse here. And as the driving laser pulse comes, you'll see the, the wake field form, as, as Dino showed in his simulation beautiful things in themselves. Oh, sorry, I missed it almost. There, here in the blue, I mean, I'll, I'll do it again. Um, so here in the blue, uh, you'll see some of the probe being, being amplified, and then it gets very strongly amplified. It gets a little bit refracted as well, but it ends up coming out almost at 90 degrees. And if you can just about see it, um, I, well, it, it's past here, but you can see that there's a very strong grating structure generated between the two pulses. I think it's the Tanaka space pulse, but that's something similar. Uh, uh, between, and, and this grating structure is 45 degrees, that would be the angle of um, uh, the K of a grating or interfering between two, two beams going perpendicular to each other. Uh, and you see that it's had some effect on the, on the wake field as well, which I don't really have time to talk about too much. But anyway, there's been amplification of the probe pulse. Uh, you can see it as a factor, as a function of distance here. The, the amplification factor is order of 10 to the 5. It's 10 to the 5 in something like the order of tens of microns, which I I don't think I've ever heard it. Somebody, maybe somebody could correct me, but I don't think you can find amplification that much anywhere in a, in a lab-based system. And it turns out when we, do, when we do spectroscopy of it, it's not a Raman signal. Even though it's coincident with the Raman signal, you can see it was only when the laser pulses interacted. And it was because of this generation of this grating structure. Uh, and so actually, it turns, it turns out to be a, a, some kind of super radiant amplification. So we're directly interacting with individual particles, turning them into a coherent structure, which is the grating, and so getting an n-squared, getting an n-squared uh, amplification because of that coherent motion. Uh, and so that's, that's pretty exciting, even for, for something completely not expected, which we didn't expect to see. Okay, some more probing data. This is even older data. This is now in the days, uh, Bob talked about it, when we used to generate electron beams with long pulse lasers, not with short pulse lasers. And, um, this is the case where you know, we would have a long pulse. We wanted to drive a wake field. It was too long to drive a wake field, but it would self-modulate into pulselets and generate a wake field anyway. And so now we're looking at the propagation characteristics of, of this laser pulse. Actually, it's a, it's a slightly different laser. Rajiv's off the hook. There's nothing, not, nothing that goes wrong here. It's his fault anymore. It's just the Vulcan laser. Um, and um, again, very similar experiment. We do probing. We do the shadowgraphy that you've seen al al already with the long shadow graph. So we, we won't see ultra fast time scale things, just, just the plasma after it, after the fact. Uh, but we also take, I'll show you some spectral, uh, spatially resolved spectra of the same thing using a transmission grating. And it should be kind of obvious when you see them. So again, this is a function of density. Again, Raoul should be very excited because it, it seems like it's completely dominated by filament. Oh, not, maybe not because you're trying to avoid filamentation. But it seems like it's completely dominated by filamentation in the first instant. Actually, so, so if you look at this, this is a, a different diagnostic. This is the Thompson scattering, the self-Thompson scattering of the interaction. Um, and that paints a slightly different picture. So you, you, you can't necessarily see that from here. But actually, you see this, this, this uh, cigar-shaped thing which is very similar to the, the cigar-shaped cone angle that the laser pulse will be focusing in and out of. 
Uh, actually, in this case, it's particularly interesting because it, it really does seem to Thompson scatter very strongly um, in, in, in it, along where the edges of the cone would be, where the gradients maybe of the intensity would be greatest. I have no explanation for that. If somebody wants to explain that to me, I will be more than happy to understand why that happens. When we go to higher density, you, you can see this actually Vulcan is a pretty poor laser spot. It's about two, three times diffraction limited in these experiments as compared to Gemini, which is mostly diffraction limited. So actually, you, you can understand why a lot of energy ends up being filamented. Uh, and also why we need particularly high critical densities before we start to see, actually, you do start to see self-focusing type effects like you see on Gemini. And uh, so when we go to, to uh, higher densities, uh, much higher P upon P crit, instead of this, this double cigar-shaped thing, you actually see a single filament in the Thomson scattering that looks like a self-focused self filament. Uh, it gets brighter along the way. And if you look at this thing, so again, remember, there's a transmission grating, so it's spectrally resolving. So this is the image with distance, and this is spectrally resolving that image. And if you see the spectrally resolved image, that's, this is the initial uh, laser frequency, one micron laser. You see there's a very bright, very bright a a Stokes line, so it's uh, dominated by Raman scattering. There's lots of anti-Stokes lines as well, uh, as well. So within the filamentation, maybe you can just pick out that there is one deeper filament here, I think I kind of pointed out. Uh, so presumably that corresponds to the self-guided part, and it, it, it is trapping a lot of the energy. And it does generate lots of electrons and things, as you've heard before. So we, we know that does happen. When we go to even higher densities, actually now you see very uh, markedly that instead of this initial cone fan, and, and for this one in particular, you can see that there's actually a region where almost all of the energy turns, turns forward and moving in a single line. So even though that there is obviously going to be filamentation here, we've somehow, by going to really high P upon P crits, we've, we've overcome the filamentation characteristics. Raoul, maybe you can explain that to me. Uh, I don't know if you've ever done filamentation for very bad quality beams. I think that's, that's, that's an issue. But anyway, it seems like you could overcome the filamentation and actually guide all of the laser energy into, into a single filament. And in, in both of these cases, you see this very deep um, channel generated. And within that very deep channel, actually, there's a point where it ends. And again, at where it ends, you can start to see this kind of hairy hedgehog, hedgehog shape coming outward. Again, a strong signature of Raman coming out sideways. And actually, if you, if you correlate down to here, where, the, where it looks like this uh, channel is ending, you see not only a very strong Raman signal, but actually you see an even stronger second Raman signal. And, and I just, just to emphasize how strange this is, this is taken with a silicon camera, which shouldn't see 1.5 microns at all. It's a bit of a mystery that it sees 1.2 microns, but there's two photon effects you can explain. So this is really, really bright. Anybody have, a, anybody have a, um, a calibration for the sensitivity of silicon cameras to infrared lasers? I would love to hear it, because I'd love to be able to actually uh, deconvolve that into a proper spectrum. But it seems like we get really, really strong infrared um, uh, generation in both of these cases. Uh, where, the, where the channel ends, again, not, not sure. Not sure why that happens. So anyway, I told you there'd be things that I really don't know. There's a lot of things I don't know. OK, one last uh, propagation um, piece of work. Um, so this is, this is a slightly, this is again on Vulcan TA West. We've, we've extended the pulse duration to 15 pe picoseconds, mainly because this is the kind of laser pulse and people talk about in fast ignition. I think uh, Tony talked about it during his talk, that it's uh, under, under studied. The idea of actually making some kind of channel, uh, you know, the original um, um, Max Tabak idea of making a channel before you send your, your laser pulse in, into the plasma. And so not, not, not with a proton beam, but we were trying to do this with a, a laser beam. So we were studying the propagation of long, long pulses. Unfortunately, not particularly high intensity. So it's probably still not really relevant to fast ignition. But anyway, that's, that's the motivation for doing a very long, long pulse. I should have said, oh, and instead of doing optical imaging, this case, this is a denser plasma, so we're going to be doing uh, proton probing as well. So this is a, a proton being generated sideways. So you can, see the, you can see the cone of the laser pulse being focused inwards. It's quite nice that actually it seems to, even, even any plasma seems to deflect a proton beam a little bit, which presumably I means there's an electric field associated with almost any plasma that you ever generate. 
uh, which is quite nice. So you can actually see the, the guiding cone coming in. The interesting thing is it within the focal volume, uh, I don't know if you can see that clearly or not, uh, but this was a little bit of a surprise to us again, is that you see, you see this structure, which, is, which looks like a wake field at first thought, but then wait a second, our proton beam is not a femtosecond pulse which freezes a wake field at all. Our, our proton probe is some picoseconds long. So this, is, this, is, this, has, this structure has to be there for picoseconds in time duration. Um, it's obviously got an electric field associated with it. It's a much denser plasma, as I said, it's, in the, it's, it's above quarter critical, maybe between quarter critical and critical. Unfortunately, since we, don't, we can't do interferometry in this thing, we don't actually know exactly the, pro, the parameters yet. So we're trying to work on that a little bit. And, and it has lots of interesting features as well. There's, there's, a, there's a very clear um, wavelength. Here it's of the order of tens of microns. This is 70 microns, but it changes as well outside of the focus. Maybe that's because the, the density is changing. This is on the order of uh, 30 microns or so, maybe, maybe smaller. Um, and you can see it, it does vary as, as, as little along different parts of the laser pulse focusing in and out. The nice thing about proton probing is in a single shot, you can get a temporal history of that structure. So, that, so because there's protons, we, we, we generate protons with lots of uh, a spread of energies. They pass through the interaction at different times. As they pass through the different times, you can see how that structure varies with time. Uh, they haven't all come out particularly clearly, but after a deconvolution, you can actually see that that structure uh, grows while our laser pulse was on, not surprisingly, and then it decays on a time of a, of a electron ion collision time. And so you can, you can kind of measure all of that. Uh, again, this is a structure we're not 100% sure what that is. We think it's uh, obviously some kind of decay into an ion, uh, an, it's an absolute ion mode, obviously it's stationary, uh, we're not sure how it happens to be 70 microns long. So uh, any, anybody got any, any good ideas on that one? We'll be uh, more than willing to accept. Um, let's have some. Okay, um, so uh, going to talk to the, the last two, I'm gonna have to rush through a little bit. Which uses of the, the electron beams that we generate. So we all, we're also actively investigating uses of the electron beams we generate. This slide is just for the people um, uh, the high field effect people, just because they got out of bed early today, uh, that we use that laser beam, I, I think, uh, Anton's talk early in the week, he talked about how using, using a, a GV electron beam now as a gamma of a couple of thousand, using that amplifies the transverse electric field, right? You get the gamma factor increase in the electric field. And so you can start thinking about doing quantum corrections to some of the radiation effects uh, that you have. And also, of course, we also have two pulses. So for example, we have two laser pulses, so we can do Compton scattering experiments. We generate electron beam directly, Compton scatter, and we see, already we see at A naught of about two, you can see that it's not a typical um, uh, spectrum that looks like just the electron spectrum multiplied. You can see that there's a bump here, which kind of maybe signifies nonlinear effects. So a, a high A naught would, would lead to harmonics, uh, in the radiation pattern, and that's potentially what we're already seeing here. Actually, we, so these, these are um, 10 to the 20 photons brightness in the units of brightness at tens of MeV, uh, where we've also done subsequent experiments even higher A naught where we're getting, um, we're getting into the tens of MeV photon, photon energies being produced at similar brightnesses, similar numbers. Uh, we can also generate po po positron beams directly, for example, by hitting some lead block and uh, again, a collaborators, collaboration with Q Queen's University Belfast are looking at um, instabilities of, um, we, all, we produce almost nearly equal numbers of positrons to electrons at some point, you know, you get an electron, turns into a shower, the positrons also turn into a shower, and at some point you, you almost end up with equal numbers of electrons and positrons, and they have quite different uh, behavior. For example, uh, I can't remember what these are, but for example, the Weibull instability is much stronger growing when you have positrons as, as, as opposed to ions, because, in a, because the positrons are mobile as well. Okay, um, the one acceleration I was gonna spend a little bit more time on talking about is of course I, there was a simpl uh, simplification when I talked about my acceleration. Obviously these electrons are coming from large transverse directions, so they'll have transverse motion when they, when they come into the bubble. And because they have transverse motion, not only will they get accelerated, but they'll, they'll because of the focusing, forwards in, focusing forces inwards, they'll undulate within that bubble structure as well. And of course, Dino talked about this as well. And so not even interacting with the laser pulse directly within the bubble fields, 
which remember are always pointing inwards, always focusing. That's why you can keep electron beam in a, in a bubble for so long. You'll get this undulating motion. And an undulator, of course, produces radiation in a one over gamma cone. And so the higher gamma you get to, the, the more energetic will be the radiation. And uh, the smaller the gamma cone will be. And this is a typical synchrotron scaling group there. So again, if you remember from our electron data, um, we, we always used to get bright uh, numbers of X-rays produced, of uh, hard X-rays, 10 kilovolt and above. But now, if you remember, you remember I talked about this second, second bunch of um, electrons which are generated at really long lengths with maybe 10 times more charge. And when we see that, um, we actually see an a, a increase, a, a, a corresponding increase in the brightness just because of the number of electrons, in, in the, the amount of uh, number of photon signals, we're easily getting in the order of, um, well, above. So it's close to 10 to the 10 uh, photons. I think we, we can exceed 10 to the 10 photons, to be honest, uh, per single shot. And I'll show you in a second why. Of course, that means um, if, if you look at the energy of the photons produced, um, I said that the first generation of electrons was to much higher energies, and so we get much higher critical energies. We get 20 kilovolts. That's just the mean average of a, of a broad spectrum, right? It's the, um, the middle of the spectrum, the critical energy, getting up to above 20 kilo, kilo, kilovolts. When you get these lower energy, larger number of photons, the, 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 the energy goes down, even, but the, the photon number goes up. We do imaging of the, of the source to show that it's actually from, the, from a micron source size. So it's actually within the bubble. That's what you expect, right? The bubble is only 10 microns, so the source size must be some smaller dimension of that. And so when you add up all of those things, um, you get a brightness, which is now exceeding 10 to the 24. And in, in again, the units of brightness uh, quite easily exceeding 10 to the 24. That's the brightest beta-tron source that we know of so far. Um, and um, it has, as I've said, it's got hard, hard energy, very small source size, small divergence, so you can make a beam line out of it. You can, you can image things even far away from the accelerator. Uh, as Gino talked about, it's a short pulse length, and it can be bright. All of those things you can use for imaging. So here's, 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 an, here's the proof of the brightness. Even, uh, on, a, on a CCD camera, immediately you see uh, objects that you put in the beam are illuminated well. You get very nice images. In fact, here, you can actually see this pretty well, though, on this projector. You can see that we even resolve a five micron grid very, very easily. So uh, that tells you that your source size is potentially smaller than that. And there's one other thing that a really small source size is very good for. It means that, um, probably you know uh, Fresnel numbers, uh, it means that your, um, your coherence length is, is very, very small. You have a high Fresnel number. Did I get that right? I don't know Fresnel numbers, it turns out. Uh, but anyway, you have, a, uh, you have a very short coherence length. So after a very, because of the small source size, because after a very small, uh, even though this is a, a broadband source of photons, after a small distance, it turns into, you'll get some spatial coherence generated. Um, again, my, my analogy is always like, if you go to a swimming pool and you randomly put your fingers into the swimming pool, dip your fingers in, it looks like a random distribution of waves very close to the source. But if you look far enough away, over some distance, you'll see, you know, you'll see phase fronts of the, of, the, of the waves being generated, which are coherent enough that you can start to do things like, uh, that, that depend on coherence. You can start to do things that, you know, uh, interference, diffraction, that kind of thing. And, and, and that's particularly nice because for most materials, uh, the, the, uh, things like diff re refraction, depend on the real part of the refractive index, which tends to increase as a function of the absorption, the, the complex part of the refractive index, by E squared. So as you go high, higher and higher energy, um, actually the, 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 the real part, the phase part, dominates over the absorption part. OK, so we have an imaging beam line. Uh, it just uses our accelerator. That's the gas cell. We have to dump the laser beam on a, on a target. We dump the electrons and diagnose them as well using a magnet. And then you're just left with a, left with a pure X-ray beam. I told you it comes out as a beam in which you can put samples. So let me show you some examples of things we've done. This is an example of using the very short duration. This is a, this is a dense target. It's a corrugated silicon target, uh, which has been hit with a laser pulse here to drive a shock. And what they're hoping to see is where there are, um, where there are little uh, dips in the corrugated target. Um, then you should see that this thing will be driven faster than the bits which are thicker. 
And you actually get microjets formed here, which is a Richmond Meshkov instability you might know about. Um, actually, it turns out we didn't drive this. Uh, it, the, the jets we drive were not as impressive as we thought they were. But actually, this, uh, our, our source allowed us to, to, to figure out why. Because if you see in this one, you can actually see that there is a shock propagating ahead of the main shock. And this shock is actually because of the pre-pulse effect. So the pre-pulse has preheated the, the plasma and sort of, sort of got rid of a little bit of our corrugation, which is why our jetting is not as impressive as it should be. There's lots of information in that. I don't really have time to talk about it in detail. Um, we also looked at medical, medical imaging. Obviously, that's a common use of x-rays. Uh, particularly, people go to hospitals when you have broken bones. But now that we have this really small source size, we can actually look at much finer features than you would do with a standard X-ray radiograph. So, for example, in cancellous bone, things like uh, your hip bone, which has a very, very fine structure to let the blood flow through, you can see in our X-ray image now you can see that um, a very fine structure demonstrated. And actually, we can rotate it. If you rotate it, you can actually see the. You can start to imagine yourself the, feed, the 3D structure. This was done over the course of a couple of hours just because of, uh, Gemini only shoots once every 20 seconds. Uh, this one is Richie's fault again. Uh, but if it was faster, obviously, we could do it, we could do it faster. Actually, you can, you can reconstruct from these multiple projections. You can generate the tomograph, uh, a, a tomographic reconstruction of the bone. And that's, this is actually what the tomographic reconstruction looks like. So you can actually get the full uh, 3D structure down to 5 micron resolution, which is, again, just a, just a function of the number of images that you take. Um, so, and so we have collaborators, medical collaborators, collaborators who are looking at osteoporosis, want to know exactly where there are cracks in bones, why they form, what that bone structure is, how dense the material is, all this kind of thing. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, I talked about at high photon energies, you, 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 start, for the, the, you, you start to be able to see uh, diffract, uh, refractive effects rather than things which depend on absorption. So for example, uh, soft tissue, this is somebody, uh, somebody's prostate. A soft tissue in an X-ray, you don't usually see much feature. But now with, with phase contrast imaging, using the, the real part of the refractive index, you can actually see the same kind of features you would see under a microscope. But this is without having to slice the thing up and put it under a microscope and stain it. This is just dumping the thing in our betatron beam and then about six months of analysis afterwards. But OK, we'll, we'll ignore that bit for now. Um, and this is a breast sample. Again, the, the, the interest would be uh, generally if you could make one of these uh, uh, imaging things small enough that you could put in a, in a hospital, then maybe you can just see here, this is a breast sample of somebody who had a tumor. And you can start to see it's very hard um, for uh, radiologists to be able to see, it's not radiologists, radiographers to be able to see those kind of features because they're pretty much soft tissue. They all look like soft tissue. In absorption, you don't see the difference between them. But here with face contrast imaging, maybe you can actually start to see the, the difference in features between the two. And, and the last one we've done in the, uh, last year, this is a mouse. This is a mouse. Uh, actually, there's two mice, um, infants, not infants, sorry, they're embryos. Uh, one is stained in iodine, one is not. Um, and we, just to see if we could do it with, with a biological sample, uh, a thicker biological sample, and this is the tomograph. You can see the, the detail that we can get out of the tomography. Uh, you can see its nostrils, eyes, everything. It's been stained in iodine, so the iodine concentrates in its liver. You can see that, the heart. Uh, this is from the mouse genotyping project where they, where they breed mice with different genes in them, uh, what's the word? They harvest them. What's the word? That's the biological word. They harvest them before they're born and then see whether the gene that they've changed makes any difference to the mouse embryo. And so they want to be able to see all the features. They want to see if the heart's bigger, if the liver's bigger, the, the whiskers are smaller, all this kind of thing. And they typically do, do this with an X-ray uh, CT, uh, CT machine, uh, which in, which in the uh, uh, iodine-absorbing regions would give similar kind of um, uh, resolution. But actually, what we see here is that we, we, we start to see features which are, which are actually soft tissue features, again, which is only observable because of the face contrast imaging. And uh, again, you can, see, you can kind of see all the features in the body there. You can see this with our big brain. Um, you can do different slices within the object because you have the full 3D reconstruction of it now. So if, you want, if you're interested in the tongue, you can look at the tongue instead. And so that's, that's very exciting as well. OK, my last talk, last 10 minutes. Acceleration. Uh, again, just a lot of people were interested in acceleration. 
So a, a, a big goal in iron acceleration in uh, recent years has been to go to thinner and thinner targets. For this, you need cleaner and cleaner laser pulses. This was done with the Vulcan laser pulse. Quite a lot often people use plasma mirrors to clean up their laser pulse, make sure that you don't destroy the thin targets beforehand. Actually, on this experiment, we did not use any kind of plasma mirror system. Uh, and this is partly a little bit because they used um, uh, something called an OPCPA front end, which cleans up quite a lot of the, the, the front end uh, uh, ASC of a laser pulse, for those who know what that is. Uh, but partly also because it's a long pulse and it can drive, even though you might have an expanding plasma, a long pulse Vulcan can actually drive up and, and, and almost reform a target a little bit as well. And so, again, people in this community will know what this is. This is an RCF stack. It's a stack, and because protons, uh, because of their Bragg peak, get to different, different distances in the stack of detectors for different energies. This is, this is the, what the beam looks like at different energies, and, and the energies are written here at the bottom. Um, and you can see that we've done it for a variation of target thicknesses. So starting from what we consider is thick, three microns, not very thick, 250 nanometers down to something really thin, 25 nanometers. Uh, and the three micron target, actually you see there are lots of low energy protons. This is kind of a usual thermal spectrum. That's always, people call that TNSA. I hate the TN bit because they're not always normal to a target. As I tell everybody, let's just call it sheath acceleration and drop the, the, the superfluous useless words at the beginning. Uh, so there's sheath accelerated proton beams. Um, here, there's kind of different feature on the 250 nanometers. You, you, you might be able to see there's kind of a ring formed. This is probably not the best example of it. But, uh, and, and there's actually, uh, if we saw more of the middle of the, uh, of the beam, where we actually take our diagnostic, there's actually almost uh, no protons right in the middle of the diagnostic, but yet it recovers again, and you get a beam which is ahead of, uh, ahead of this ring. And so there's a, there's a ring structure there, and then there's a beamlet right in the middle of the beam formed. Uh, these, uh, so this kind of, inter I'll, I'll, no, I'll tell you about that in, in a second. Well, here, actually, maybe for the thinnest target, you can see the ring really, really clearly. You can also see that the bit that fills in, and you can see that the bit that fills in is actually very, very um, uh, filamented, again, for want of a better word. Um, Bouchon talked about this earlier in the week. This, this is the kind of target, this 25 nanometer target, where we are thin enough to be able to, to think about driving directly by the radiation pressure of the laser. It seems like this radiation pressure drive is very unstable. It's very hard to get a nice beam quality. However, when you go up to these thicker targets, you can get to much higher energies. And, and it turns out if we correlate the maximum proton energy that we get, it correlates very well to the maximum electron energy that we get as well in these, in, from these interactions, both measured with a, a spectrometer of some kind. Um, and, and I'll show you the reason why. So here's the simulation started. There's contours of density. It starts over dense, so this is all over dense. You're gonna see some particular particle trajectories, and you might just be able to see the stars. It wasn't particularly good color choices here, but you'll see the stars of some electrons which are gonna be Accelerate it. You can see the density is getting lower and lower as, the, as this target heats up to the point that now that it's actually broken through and you, you start to get the laser transmitted. Bouchan talked about this as well. This is, this is uh, relativistic transparency. It's transparent even though the density is 3N critical. Uh, and oh, I missed what the, happened to the particles, but you could see just at the point that it was going critical, electrons which happened to be somewhere near this aperture were the ones which were gaining most energy. So actually something that aperture is somehow related to the maximum energy gain. Again, that's something that needs to be worked on. We're not completely 100% sure how that's happening, but I am not sure that's kind of an interesting uh, area of study as well. Um, so it's, so it's this, this transparency, this middle um, target thicknesses, the, the 100 nanometer targets, which are actually giving us our, our highest energy gains. Actually, um, one of our colleagues that Dino you know, talked about, Paul McKenna has now used that kind of target to get to 90 MeV uh, protons, which I think is the highest, at least the highest that I believe anyway. Uh, proton energies producing these kind of interactions. Um, okay, I, we see there's a lot of problems with um, um, with thin targets, foil targets. So we we try to look of another way where we could study radiation pressure, but maybe in a bit more detail. And so instead of going for thin targets, we actually went for low density targets. Actually, going for critical density targets. Um, that's actually very difficult. Ten to the twenty one critical density for optical lasers is a difficult density range to get to. And so we cheated a bit. We actually used a CO2 laser. This is a CO2 laser at Brookhaven National Laboratory. And, um, and um, because of its 10 micron wavelength, the critical density goes down as one over lambda squared. And so we can, we can use a 10 to the 19 plasma. That's the same kind of plasma that we would use for 
Wakefield acceleration, just a gas jet target to be able to get a critical density surface. And actually, when you, when you look at, uh, and, and now it's a, it's a low density plasma, you could, again, you can probe all the way through it. You can see all the, the physics happening. You can see things like um, blast waves being generated and then an interaction service, which drives a lot of fast electrons. This is the Weibel instability that people have been talking about. Again, we're not completely sure we understand the Weibel in our situation. I press the wrong button again. So uh, that's, that's something people could uh, help us with, if anybody's a really a Weibel uh, expert here. Um, but actually, it turns out when we hit this kind of target, actually, we do get, we do get some really nice mono-energy to be in. The intensity of this laser is not particularly high. It's only a 10 to the 16 watt per centimeter squared laser. We get these really nice monogenic beams sometimes. And the first experiment we did, they were very, very irreproducible, and we didn't really understand why until we saw on the imaging this, this bubble, the, the blast wave structure. And we thought maybe that blast wave structure is somehow important because if you look at our, density, our gas jet density profile, it actually has very long, um, you can almost uh, mimic it with a triangle. It has very, very long scale lengths. So what we suggested was to actually make that, that blast wave structure ahead of time, which we do by some, um, some heating of a plasma within, within the, within the, uh, near the critical density target, and just letting it expand as a, as a collisional shock, as a blast wave. And by the time that you let it expand, then you get this much sharper density rise uh, feature uh, formed with higher density, kind of perfect for what you want for um, for the, for, the, for the acceleration that we see. And so we did that, uh, we, we, we varied our pre-pulse. When we had no pre-pulse, this is what the interaction looked like, this is what the original critical density surface, uh, and you, we actually got no, no electrons. When we had two bigger pre-pulse, then we just blow a hole through the whole plasma and we don't get any electrons. But when you get it just right, as usual, um, you make this nice blast wave, and in, in the region where we get the blast wave just right, you can actually we actually accelerated helium ions as well. Helium ions, you don't get a monogenic beam, but uh, for other reasons, but uh, uh, you could get monogenic proton beams. Again, a simulation to kind of explain, but I'll, sh I'll show you again that there is a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, physics happening. So a, a laser hits a target. Notice that it has to be a relatively sharp density gradient for, this, for any of this thing to happen. If it's a long density gradient, then we get all the filamentation and all the instabilities in the long scale length and, and nothing interesting happens. Uh, we get a piston that drives, that's gonna drive a density spike. That density spike is being driven faster than the, I mean, this is a cold plasma ahead of it. So it's gonna turn into a shock. You see the shock forming um, and you can see the, the oscillations of the shock is the sag day of potential that you would expect of a collisional shock. Very, very, Robinson. it's typical uh, collisional shock. You also see these things here. There's a density spike of protons, which in that very initial stage where the, where the proton, where that density spike was very, very high, it had a very large associated electric field. And that very large associated electric field was enough to, to almost a bunch of, of protons to be accelerated almost instantaneously. And uh, as you go further in time, that just, that just moves, ahead of, um, moves ahead of the shock. But the shock moves at the typical V shock velocity. But if you look at the bunch, then the bunch that went ahead, it has the nice monogenic feature that we see in our, in our experiment. Um, okay, uh, I, I actually, now that I remember, I had, didn't put any collaborators on the ion acceleration experiments on here. So this is a partial list of our collaborators, uh, but we have uh, obviously people working on the high field physics part of things, on, on weight field accelerators, people helping with the simulations. We have a lot of um, medics, so, um, it's, it's a big team of people, but we're, we're open to more collaboration. There is more work than I could ever do in a lifetime here. Uh, but obviously, I say I do, I obviously I don't do all the work. I do none of the work almost. And the work was mostly done by these very talented people. So these are our, our postdocs at Imperial, a bunch of PhD students as well. Um, and that's um, to my conclusions. So uh, in a Wakefield accelerator, we get two GV gain, just driving. I mean, we're, we're not doing anything particularly clever. Uh, in particular, we're not clever because we don't really understand the interaction in full detail yet. Uh, we would, we, I, I, I think we talked earlier in the week about doing acceleration in more linear wakes where you can control the acceleration a little bit better, where you don't get, I might not have said actually, the, the, the low energy of the, the, the initial um, uh, monoenergetic beams was a little bit because the, the laser pulse, is, everything is still so dynamic, the laser pulse, which, which expands the bubble, makes it easier to inject particles, 
also unfortunately limits the maximum energy you can gain out of them. So all these things we'd like to overcome, and, and then some of that can be done by accelerating at even lower intensities now that we have a source of electrons to put into a linear wave. Uh, in the radiation things, uh, obviously we have these very hard x-rays that we can produce with very, very large brightness. We are going to continue, obviously, on our imaging um, uh, applications and, and, and actually try, to, uh, as Dino said as well, going above um, um, the 100 kilovolt range is very hard to characterize, but that's al already a very interesting area for imaging applications as well. So uh, we'd like to better characterization of that and continue with our imaging exper experiments. And for the ion beams, um, well, uh, we, we generate these monogenetic uh, beams by shock acceleration. Um, there are ideas, and there are plenty of ideas. For example, you saw that the, the proton beam very quickly uh, goes faster than the shock, and so people have ideas of how to control the shock, uh, um, shock speed, for example, by using density variations, things like this, better control of targets, um, may be able to get us to higher energy, and, and in any case, there are plans afoot to, to go to higher intensity and study all of these things busy for many years, actually. Um, one thing I'll go back to, and that is the, the, pro the iron probing of the uh, structure that looked like an iron feature. One of the things that we worked on, and we're still working on, is the relaxation of the, of the um, structure after you've accelerated the particles. So you want to find out how uniform the plasma is after your beam has gone through for the next beam to come in. So if you're doing a high rep rate system, you want to find out how quickly the thing goes back to a, a uniform medium. And one of the things we looked at is this high Langmuir wave modulation of instability. And it can be driven also by the electrons, the electrons that are around at the time. And that would give you a, a modulation at the high acoustic wavelengths. And it'd okay. be a stationary structure. Okay. So there's some papers written in that, but I don't know for the parameters that you've got. I would have to be careful with that again. Okay. Your parameters. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, if you could talk about that, send me the papers. Yeah. So, because it is close to critical density, we are thinking maybe it was some direct um, decay, or parametric decay type could be, thing, or yeah. as well. So that was oscillating two stream, though. The oscillating two stream gives you the iron features that are, it's like the transverse modulation. That right. gives you the iron features across the, the critical surface. Whereas the, the modulational one gives it along the structure. So it would be parametric so decay. The parametric decay in the long, along the direction of the probe. So, but the, the, the thing I wasn't really sure is why it should be tens of micron. Well, I don't know either. I mean, that's something we'd have to look at. You said 70 micron, I think I wrote down. I don't know. We'd have to look at the parameters carefully. Yeah, just to add to that, that's an important problem as you go to high rep rate. Uh, acceleration as well. So uh, for 10 hertz, I don't think we'll have issues. But when people want to go to 100 hertz, for example, that's what um, ideally you actually wanted to do initially. But there's no such laser uh, yet. Yeah. Well, we, we, our estimate is that you can get up to almost uh, like a uh, you know hundreds of uh, uh, megahertz sort of thing, a uh, millihertz, millihertz, and still be okay. No, was that megahertz, megahertz? Yeah, I, I actually, one thing I forgot. You have to say. check that, but that's a, it's a relaxation. I mean, you mentioned it. It's the electron ion uh, equilibration collision time scale. That's what it is. And that you've got to look at some e foldings of that, et cetera. Just on the energy deposition thing, I, sh I should have said so e even the, um, so with the F40, we actually get higher conversion efficiencies now to 5% in the electron beam. Whereas Dina was saying there's still a lot of unaccounted for energy, which is, which is going to be a limit of how fast you can run. Any other questions? Um, we, we, we didn't um, sort of um, uh, look at your data, but we looked at the um, Chan Joshi's data on the similar kind of structure, and we put together a simple little model for that on the nine acoustic shock. It was 1D with Alan Cairns and myself, actually. I think we need to do some serious simulations of that, actually, and really see what's going on. But they've been doing some, I think, with Osiris as well. Yeah, so, yeah, there, there is a, a fair bit of work. Mm -hmm. um, I, for example, we can't, we can't replicate their 
uh, data really exactly, but then again, maybe we're looking at slightly different diagnostics yeah. and slightly different targets and things like that. So, One of the applications that we thought about using for this idea that you've got here is to uh, take a CO2 laser, similar to what Predeman was talking about earlier on, and hitting the coronal plasma of an, a pre-compressed fuel pellet, generating shock waves that would accelerate ions in the corona region, which would then actually um, uh, ignite the fuel. Actually, that was the idea. I didn't present that here, but we have some evidence that we can do that. Perfect. And then, and then uh, actually, uh, no, another interesting thing about this is that because you can, you can actually probe the whole, dag the whole interaction yeah. for, for some basic, even though it's an accelerated test facility, for some basic plasma physics studies, you're going to be able to see almost everything that happens. Uh, unfortunately, the only thing we don't have is a short probe, so if they're very dynamic, we don't see that. Uh, That's the but proton probe. That's the one you're well, we, we don't have a proton probe at all. <laughs> but, well, that's not even short enough. I think you need an optical probe that's very short to be able to see, you know, like structures ahead of time. But things like studying magnetized plasma, putting a magnet in this interaction, even though we might not be able to probe everything um, for some initial tests, that kind of experiment is possible. So this mono uh, energetic proton beam, what is the sort of key mechanism because of which you get uh, energy with shrinking? Um, so if you, if I have a, here. So, so if you look at the, if you look at the shock that goes with the potential, um, it, if you uh, know the sag of potential, right? Um, so it's, it's a very strong peak. It's, it's almost like a wall that's being driven again uh, against this plasma. And if you make it large enough, so in, 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 the, in the short duration that you make it large enough, um, again, it's, it's almost like um, batting a ball, right? It takes upstream ions, and in, in, in the phase space, you'll see them going uh, in, in the stationary frame of the shock. They look like they're coming into the shock. They gain all of the energy up the potential, and they turn back with twice the shock velocity. So they gain twice the shock velocity in the stationary frame. Um, uh, so, so going from minus V shock to plus V shock, you go back to the lab frame, that's a plus two V shock gain in energy. So that's four times the, the energy, the four, velocity, four times the energy gain of all the, the stationary plasma. And the rest of the plasma is slowing down, right? The rest of the shock is slowing down. But these, these protons going ahead through a cold plasma just leave the plasma afterwards. But the ions are massive. They don't move much within the short pulse time, right? Oh, the fields are enormous. The fields are terawatts per meter, even over tens of micron. They'll gain, they'll gain MEV2, MEV, which is enough to be, move ahead of the shock. 